complicate things. If you've ever learned something new, if you've ever tried to learn how to do something, at first you might think, yeah, it looks complicated. It looks really like, could I ever do this? And then somebody shows and you're like, oh, okay, it's not that bad. Like learning to drive, for example. When, you, when you're learning how to drive, maybe you're in that stage where you, you're learning how to drive and you're thinking like, how am I going to remember everything? But eventually, you, it just becomes second nature. It becomes like, well, how do you drive? Well, you, you just climb in your car and drive. You know, your kids ask you, but how do you know when to change gears? I don't know. You just, you just know. You just change gears when you're supposed to change gears. And sometimes we can overcomplicate things. And I love, if you look at Jesus when he was teaching, he, he was so simple and basic in his teaching. And, and so often, we complicate things in our own lives. We complicate the gospel. We complicate what it means to be a Christian. We complicate even the word of God. And then you look at Jesus' teaching and how simple and practical and straightforward it is. And it was. Remember, he was speaking to his disciples and they, were, they weren't super educated guys. Crowds start gathering around him. They weren't the, he wasn't preaching to the, the pastors and the theologians. No, he was just preaching to to, to people that were around him, fishermen, tax collectors, unemployed, employed, married, divorced, single, want to be married, never been married. It's a whole bunch of people who were just following him, longing, wanting to learn. And those are the people that were gathered around him, just everyday, ordinary people. And he starts teaching them about what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's very, very straightforward, very, very simple. And so Matthew chapter 5, we're going to look at two pictures this morning. Two things that Jesus speaks over his disciples and two things that, that Jesus speaks over us and he speaks over his church. And he says, you are the salt of the earth and you are the light of the world. The salt of the earth and the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5. I'm just going to go ahead and pray and then we're going to get into it. Father, I thank you for your word, Lord Jesus. I thank you that you speak into us even today, Lord, as we gathered Lord, and we, we may have heard this a hundred times before. We may have read it even this week. We may have heard many sermons about this, Lord Jesus. But I just pray, Father, that again, through your Holy Spirit, you would come and speak and make these, we bring these words to life, Lord. I pray that as we work through this this morning, that much fruit would come from this, Lord. Not because of us, but because of your word spoken us, over us, Lord. Because of your word spoken into our lives, because of that, Lord Jesus, that much fruit would come, Lord. And so I pray, come and speak, Lord. We come with open ears and open hearts this morning, Father. Come in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13 to 16. So Jesus has just finished the Beatitudes, and he goes on to say, remember he's speaking to his disciples, people are starting to gather around him, and he's looking at his disciples, and he's saying, you, you, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Now, let me just stop there. What do you, what do, what do you highlight out of that? What are you highlighting out of that verse of what Jesus just said? What are you highlighting in your mind? I can guarantee you now you're highlighting, but if salt loses its saltiness, you're going to get thrown out, okay? You're forgetting about the, you are the salt of the earth. Isn't it so natural that we do that? <laughs> you're looking at the, ooh, but if I lose my saltiness, okay? You are the light of the world. Remember, Jesus is speaking to his disciples. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus said two things. He says, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. Amen. Let's close in prayer. No, literally, no, okay, we won't. We're going we're gonna to carry on a bit, but that's literally what he's saying. And we over, because my saltiness, or oh, if I'm hiding my light under the basket, if I'm not doing what God, and we, 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 we focus on that instead of focusing on what Jesus had said, that you are the salt and you are the light. Now, we, we need to remember that Jesus was speaking to his disciples. 
and they were in a very different time. They were living a different lifestyle. They were largely an agrarian society. They were mostly farmers living off the land. That's who they were. And so Jesus is speaking into, to them. And we listen to that today, and we, we kind of think, well, salt, like salt. Like nobody ever says to you, hey, do you check they're having a special on salt at spa? I mean, like, who cares? It's like five rand a kilogram. Like, what's so special about salt and light? I mean, light. Everybody, everybody's got light, okay? We struggle with that in South Africa. But uh, we got our challenges with light, right? And we kind of brush it off very, very easily. And I think we also live in a culture that's very, very uh, much driven by achievement, by what you've achieved in life, right? And social media doesn't help us with that. Very, our culture is very achievement driven. What have you achieved in life? What have you become? How much have you made of your life? What car do you drive? Where, where do you live? Where do your kids go to school? Where do you shop? Where do you, who do you hang out with? Where do you go out for dinner? Where do you, very achievement driven. And there's a lady, her name is Brene Brown. And she's a researcher at the University of Houston. And she's written a few books on this. And she's written a book that she's spoken about shame and vulnerability. And I started reading it a few, a few days ago. And she says the following. She says, men and women experience the pressure of achievement in very different ways. We do. We experience the pressure of achievement in very different ways. And this is what she says about how women experience this pressure of achievement. She says, women are expected and sometimes desire to be perfect. Yet we're not allowed to look as if we're working for it. We want it just to materialize somehow. Everything should be effortless. The expectation is to be natural beauties, natural mothers, natural leaders, and naturally good parents. And we want to belong to naturally fabulous families. And then she goes on to say, a woman is forced into impossible either ors. Either ors. And this is her list. She says, you must be perfect, but don't make a fuss about it. And don't take time away from anything, like your family or your partner or your work, to achieve your perfection. If you're really good, perfection should be easy. Don't, get, don't upset anyone or hurt anyone's feelings, but say what's on your mind. Dial the sexuality way up after the kids are down, the dog has walked, and the house is clean. But dial it way down at the school parent meeting. Whatever you do, don't get confused the two. Just be yourself, but not if it means being shy or unsure. Don't make people feel uncomfortable, but be honest. Don't get too emotional, but don't be too detached either. Too emotional and you're hysterical. Too detached and you're a cold-hearted witch. True. Men, men, no, there's this pressure of having to be this perfect mother, this perfect wife, this perfect family with, you know, and then men, this is what she says about men. Men are also, uh, uh, we experience it differently. She says the following, basically, men live under the pressure of one unrelenting message. Don't be perceived as weak. Don't fail. Don't fail at work. Don't fail in marriage. Don't fail in bed. Don't fail with your money. Don't fail with your children. It doesn't matter. Don't fail. Don't be wrong. Don't be soft. Don't reveal any weakness or fear. Don't get criticized and don't get ridiculed. True, huh? We live under this unrelenting pressure to make it look like we have these perfect lives when deep down inside we are struggling. We're hurting. We're broken. But don't let anybody know. But deep down inside, we have the struggle to be, we're achievement driven. We're driven by, by what we've done in life. Not by who we are in Jesus, but by what we've done. And there's this pressure for us as believers to live under this of, this is what I do. That's why Jesus loves me. This is what I've done. That's why Jesus saves me. That's, this is why Jesus has accepted me because I've done this or I've done that or I've achieved this in life or I've done this in life. I want to say that men, men, you are weak. We are weak. I don't care how much protein powder you eat and how many beers you can down. We are weak, right? We are frail. 
Deep down inside, we struggle with things. We don't have it all together. Sometimes we look like we do, but we don't. And woman, you are not perfect. You're never going to be the perfect mom, the perfect wife, the perfect Matthew chapter 5. That we get our identity from what Jesus speaks over us. Not from what society says or what people says. Or say, people says, yeah. See, I've got an F for English. <laughs> Not what, not what people say or society says or what we put on ourselves or what social media says, that we get our identity from what Jesus speaks over our lives. And that's the starting point. And from that place, we be who God has called us to be. Before Jesus' disciples had done anything, they had just started following him. They hadn't raised any bro from the dead. They hadn't fasted and prayed. They hadn't gone and preached the gospel. They'd done absolutely nothing. They were just following him. Hey, Jesus, he called them, just, just come and follow me. And they go and they follow him. And he says to them, you are the salt of the earth. Before you've done anything, before you've prayed for anybody, before you've spoken anything, you are the salt of the earth. And you are the light of the world. And that's God's words over us, over you today. If you're here and you're walking with Jesus and you're following Jesus, Jesus says over us, his people and his church, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You are. Identity before activity. Identity before activity. When Jesus came to the earth, he had done nothing. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. There was a time where he was baptized. And he gets baptized and his father looks at him and he says, this is my son who I love, in him I am well pleased. And we need to hear those words from our father, don't you? I need to hear them from my father. This is my son, Jakes, you are my son, who I love, and you, I'm well pleased. Identity before activity. Jesus says in John 15, he says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. God's words over us, and I just, I just wrote down a few things this morning as I was thinking about today. God says that we loved. you chosen by him. You're forgiven. You're adopted into his family. You've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. You've been accepted. You're a new creation. You are God's masterpiece. This is my son whom I love. In him, I am well pleased. And it, isn't it so much of God's character to call people to something before they are that something or to rename people according to what he sees in them? Or sees them becoming. Remember Gideon. Gideon's hiding away from God in a wine press, fearing for his life. God looks at him and says what? Mighty man of valor. He wasn't that right now. He wasn't a mighty man there. But God could see what he wanted him to become. Abraham. Abraham and Sarah. They, they couldn't have children. And they were getting old. The Bible says well advanced in years. That's the politically correct way of saying they're becoming bullies. Yeah, they're getting, they're getting long in the tooth. I don't know what you say. They're getting old. God looks at Abraham and says, calls him a father of many nations. They waited 25 years. 25 years for that promise to be fulfilled. Don't you think 25 years? Okay. Think 25 years. 25 years ago, we were all fearing Y2K. That was 25 years ago. I don't know if you remember Y2K. You thought like all your money in your account is going to be gone. You can't draw any money. Your computer is going to crash. The whole world is going to come collapsing down because now 1999 is going to change to 2000. They're running out of digits or some nonsense and it's, everything's just going to come crashing down. That was 25 years ago. It felt like yesterday. 25 years ago. Eh? 25 years ago, the first Matrix movie came out. Matrix 1. 25 years. It was a classic. Eh? 25 years ago. 25 years ago. 25 years ago, either you or your parents were listening to Believe by Sure, hey, or No Scrubs by TLC, hey, I don't know what you were listening to, 
or you were listening to uh, Scar Tissue by Red Hot Chili Peppers. I don't know what. That, that came out 25 years ago. You were listening to, nobody's going to put their hand up for this one, but you were listening to Baby One More Time by Britney Spears. I see that hand. There we go. 25, a lot happens in 25 years. They waited 25 years, but God looks at him and says, the father of many nations. God looks at Simon Peter, and he casts Simon, and he renames him Peter from a reed to a rock. Jesus looks at his disciples, and he says, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. So we're going to look at those two pictures uh, very quickly this morning. You are the salt of the earth. And like I said, if you think of salt nowadays, you think, oh, well, there's nothing. It's not too expensive. It's not too valuable. But... Imagine the world without salt, right? I don't know what kind of person you are. Either you taste your food first, and then you're like, hey, we need some more salt, or you just put salt on it anyway, and then you eat it. I know some guys, I'm not going to point them out, but before they've tasted their food, they bomb salt on it. It's like, imagine life without salt. But now for us, it's not a valuable, I mean, if you, if you mess salt, if you spill salt, it's not expensive. But in Jesus' time, salt was very valuable. In fact, that's where we get the word salary from, is salt. Because people were paid in salt at times. You earned, you know, that man is worth his salt. That's where that saying comes from. They were paid using salt. It was very valuable. And they would go and get it often like around the Dead Sea. They would go and dig it up and, and sort of mine it, if you want, if you want to say that. Um, but obviously, as you're mining it, as you're digging it up, you're getting all sorts of other impurities with it, mud and sand and soil and all sorts of stuff. And they would try their best to use whatever they could. But eventually, at the end of the day, they were left with this white sort of residue that looked like salt, but it wasn't. It was just like a waste product. It looked like salt, but it wasn't actually. They go and taste it. No, nah, that's, that's something else. It's not salt. Okay? In those days, salt was very, very valuable. Things that it adds flavor. We know that. It preserves meat. I mean, imagine a life without built on. Imagine. Sad, right? Preserves meat. It purifies. It makes you thirsty, right? Why do you think they had those very, 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 very salty peanuts on the bar counter when you go? Apparently, they have them on the bar counter when you go for a beer. I've heard. Somebody told me. They, they have these. Naveen told me. No, I'm joking. <laughs> Why? Because it makes you thirsty. You buy more beer, right? Salt makes you thirsty. It also has healing properties. It's very, very useful. It's an agent of change. It changes its environment. Salt isn't change. It changes what it's added to. It enhances. It adds flavor. It purifies. It cleans. It, that's what salt does. We are called to add flavor to a very boring, dull, bland world. And God has scattered us. You, you, salt in a salt shaker. I don't care how fancy your salt shaker is, and there's all sorts of fancy ones you get. If that salt stays in that shaker, it's useless. You've got to shake it out of that shaker. You've got you to spread it. You've got to scatter it. You've got to pour it out, right? And God has taken us. If you think of us as being the salt of the earth, that God has taken us and he's scattered us where he's placed us. He's scattered us in, into our homes. He's scattered us into our work environment. environment. He's scattered us where he's placed us, in our families, in our homes, in our workplaces, wherever God has us, he's scattered us. And as we leave here today, it's no use us, all these nice, good-looking salt shakers just staying here, right? And you don't salt salt. Who's ever added salt to salt? No, you, you add salt to something else. We're not here to salt each other or assault each other. Definitely not here to assault each other. We're here to salt the earth. As we leave this place today, we've been scattered. See yourself as salt being scattered. God, where you've placed me, you're scattering us all over the city. There's salt being scattered in Zini and in Guelazan and Empangini, Richards Bay, wherever. Felixton, Ndabayaki, wherever God has called us, he's scattering us like you would scatter salt to add flavor, to bring life. To give people a taste, a thirst for God. That God would, people would actually thirst for God because of your life. Imagine, I mean, that would be, thank you, Lord, that we would create a thirst in people for more of God because of where God has placed us. Scattering us. 
But then he goes on to say, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Scientifically speaking, salt can never lose its saltiness. It's one of the most stable things. Salt can never lose its saltiness. And in fact, if you take salt and you, you mix it into water, it doesn't actually dissolve into the water. You can get it back again. You can take salt, chuck it in a cup. I mean, you've done this in science probably in school. And you want to get the salt back. You can get it back. You just evaporate the water. And what you get left with is salt. Salt is still there. So salt can never lose its saltiness. What Jesus is saying, if it's lost its saltiness, then it wasn't salt in the first place. That's what he's saying. And like I said, when they were going to go and dig up salt and go and find salt, they would dig up and it would, they would, you know, you, there wasn't just pure salt lying around. They would go and get it from the Dead Sea. And often you'd get other things, sand and mud and dirt and stuff. And you'd have some, you'd use the salt up. What you'd be left with was often this white powder that was left. And it looks like salt, but it isn't salt. And that's what Jesus was saying. But there's a caution here for us. That although you can't lose your saltiness, you can be so diluted that you don't even know the salt is there. You can become so diluted. Like if I had to, if after the meeting I had to go and take your, your, your cup of coffee and add a teaspoon of, of salt to that, right, you would know it's there. If you didn't, I'd be like, you okay? <laughs> Maybe you need, your taste buds are gone. I don't know. If I had to add a teaspoon of salt to your cappuccino, you would know it's there. But if I had to go and take a teaspoon of salt and add it to a lake or a dam or something, fresh water, you wouldn't even know it's there because it's so diluted. And, and a caution, and a, and a caution to us, we don't lose our saltiness. We still stay salt, but we, we can become so diluted by the world around us that the world doesn't even know that we're there, right? That's what Jesus was saying. Don't lose your saltiness. Don't lose the reason why I've placed you where I've placed you. You're still salt, but don't get so diluted by the world and things around you that you blend right in without nobody even knowing that you're there. That's what Jesus was saying. And as I was reading that this week, I thought to myself, but Lord, you're, <laughs> there are many times I don't feel very salty, right? I feel like, I'm struggling sometimes with my walk with God. I'm struggling my relationship with God. I, honestly, I wrestle with things. I wrestle with God with thoughts. I don't know about you, but probably the, the biggest way, the most common way that, that I get harassed by the enemy or by the devil is in my thoughts. Entertaining negative thoughts that you kind of should push back and should ignore and should not entertain, but you start entertaining them. It becomes like a habit and a rhythm and you start thinking things that aren't of God. And I've got to wrestle, wrestle often with those things in my heart and in my mind. And often I don't feel very salty. I don't feel like I'm very salty right now, Lord Jesus. But then I come back to God's word. I come back to what he's spoken over me. And he says, you are salt. And if you walk with me, I'm going to make you saltier and saltier and saltier. If you stick with me, if you walk with me, if you look to me, if you abide in me, we're on this journey. And yes, there are going to come times where you don't feel that salty, but you still, doesn't make you unsalt. You don't lose your saltiness. You're still salt. So Jesus isn't talking about losing our salvation. He's just talking about losing our effectiveness. Losing, the, losing being effective where God has placed us. So you are the salt of the earth, not the salt of the church. You're the salt of the earth. The earth needs you where God has placed you. And then he goes on the second picture he talks about is light. You are the light of the world. And think about life without light. I mean, we know that. South Africa, we know what it's like. Light is there to push back darkness. So there's no such thing as darkness. There's only such thing as absence of light. So light is there to push back darkness and to illuminate, to show the way. God calls us the light of the world. Or the light of you know, the light of the world. 
But then you read in John where Jesus says that I am the light of the world. Then you go back to Matthew 5 and he says, you are the light of the world. Then he talks about a lamp, a lamp that has been lit. He says, you are the light of the world, a town built on a hill that cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. He calls us a lamp. And if you think of a lamp, a lamp has got a wick, and that wick needs to be in some sort of oil that burns, that, 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 that's fuel. And if you think of your life, we're not, we're not called to be stars or suns. We're called to be lamps. That Jesus comes as you give his, your life to him. As you come and you give your life to him, he comes and he lights that lamp. And he gives you the oil of the Holy Spirit to allow you to burn. As long as we're drawing from him like a lamp, we're able to burn. But he's the one who's lit us. He's the one who comes and lights us. And then he says, you are the light of the world. You are there to illuminate. You are there to show people to me. You are there to push back darkness. And don't we need that in our world nowadays? We need that. And again, I, there's times I don't feel like I'm very bright. I'm not shining very brightly. I'm like, hey, that, like it uh, shine bright like a diamond. Beyonce, yeah. But you, somebody should tell you, actually, diamonds don't shine. It should be reflect light like a diamond. But anyway, so sometimes we don't feel so bright. Like I'm not shining so brightly, Lord. I feel like this light of mine, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. Sometimes it feels like it ain't shining so brightly. But then we come back to the word of God. God, you call me the light of the world. Despite how I'm feeling, despite of what the world says, you've called me to be the light of the world. And you've placed me, and he says you light a lamp and you put it on its stand where it belongs. You put it where it belongs on its stand. And if it's where it belongs, it gives light to everybody in the house, so let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father who is in heaven. God has placed you. He has chosen where he wants to place you so you can shine. You can shine for him. Salt is meant to be scattered and light is there to push back the darkness. Our city should be different, taste different, look different because of where God has placed you. Because of where God has scattered you and because, because of where God has placed you, our cities should look different. And as I land this morning, I just want to read a quote from John Stott about this picture of us being the salt and the light of the world. He says, in both these metaphors of the salt and the light, Jesus teaches about the responsibility of Christians in a non-Christian or sub-Christian or post-Christian society. He emphasizes the difference between Christians and non-Christians, between the church and the world. And he emphasizes the influences Christians ought to have on the non-Christian environment. The distinction between the two is clear. The world, he says, is like rotting meat. But you are to be the world's salt. The world is like a dark night, but you are to be the world's light. This is the fundamental difference between the Christian and the non-Christian, the church and the world. Like salt, in a putrefying, like salt in putrefying meat, Christians are to hinder social decay. The light in the prevailing darkness, Christians are to illuminate society and show it a better way. It is very important to grasp these two stages in the teaching of Jesus. Most Christians accept that there is a distinction between the Christian and the non-Christian, between the church and the world, God's new society, the church, is as different from the old society as salt from rotting meat and as light from darkness. But there are too many people who stop there, too many people whose whole preoccupation is with survival, that is, maintaining the distinction. The salt must retain its saltiness, they say. It must not become contaminated. The light must retain its brightness. It must not be smothered by the darkness. That is true, but that is merely survival. 
salt and light are not just a bit different from their environment. They are to have a powerful influence on the environment. The salt is to be rubbed into the meat in order to stop the rot. And the light is to shine into the darkness. It is to be set upon a lampstand and it is to give light to the environment. That is an influence on the environment quite differently from mere survival. So church, as we land this morning, go. As we leave this place today and be scattered, go and be the salt of the earth. Go from this place and be the light of the world because that is what God has called us to be. Amen. Let's pray.